Self-Publishing Podcast, episode number 30. Welcome to the Self-Publishing Podcast, where if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. And now, here are your hosts, sometimes known as the Shill, the Nose, and the Yeti, <laughs> Johnny, Sean, and Dave. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the Self-Publishing Podcast, the podcast that's all about how to get your words out into the world without contending with agents, publishers, or the other gatekeepers in traditional publishing. I'm Johnny B. Truant, and my co-hosts are Sean Platt and David Wright. And Dave is improving while Sean is, is uh, you know, it's kind of a... Evolving. Um, yeah, well, it's kind of a Flowers for Algernon sort of thing that we have there. <laughs> awesome. By the way, I was, li- I was listening to the latest episode of, of Better Off Undead, and we got all intellectual and shit. Oh, God. Really? No, I mean, it was good. It, it wasn't intellectual, and I don't think it was annoying. I think it was good intellectual. Oh, that's cool. What did we say? My depression <laughs> is intellectual in nature. No, 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 but I mean... Can we was... spend this episode talking about that episode? It's <laughs> <laughs> all meta. That was amusing. By the way, the episode we're talking about is, was called What the Fuck is Wrong with Dave? Oh, that's a classic right. already. But it wasn't <laughs> One for it, the archives. It wasn't just discussing what's wrong with Dave that made it intellectual. It was that we were talking about like why do people like uh, torture porn? Why is why is uh, horror gotten more extreme and vicarious oh. thrills? And yeah, there was good conversation there. It was. It was good. I everybody's probably going to like all the inmates that listen to us are probably going to be all mad. <laughs> okay, well, here's what's funny. Masturbating. I yeah. just got I, okay. Here's here's how slow my technology is working for some reason, Johnny. I just got your text like this second, the second one you sent. When did you send that? I thought you were gonna say you just got Betamax. No, <laughs> it was like it was like five minutes ago. Okay, Speaking I just torture porn. I just got that one, and then after that. I just got your email that says you fuckers know we're on five minutes ago, right? Yeah, I was getting I was getting all angry. I was sitting here in a Google Hangout, and it was like ten minutes past the time we were supposed to start. And Sean made a big deal about needing to start. We wanted to, you know, be done by two because we changed our time. We're now on it. Okay, Dave just added the effect, so I'm waiting. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the clock, the ticking clock. Um, so I'm like waiting for him, and I'm in the Hangout. And I'm getting all angry. I'm like, come on! I rushed home. I'm trying to do this. And then I realized that I had forgotten to invite them. So he has a bikini waxing it too. So we got to wrap. You were this talking up. about Brazilians, and I was going to say something. About, I was going to make a Brazilian wax joke, but since we were off the air, I don't like to make humor unless I can impress other people. I'm sad. That <laughs> it's a waste of time. Otherwise, really. Right. Why bother to say things? Um, Why bother to wake up? <laughs> I've been uh, outlining. Fat Vampire 3, and the reason that that's noteworthy from a self-publishing or authoring standpoint is that I've never fully outlined something before. Oh, wow. So, how, how, what do you mean by fully outlined? How detailed is the outline? Like compared to um, the, uh, Unicorn Western, which has just very like vague beats to go Well, down. it's a little more detailed than that, but I've never, I've never even done that, and that is the reason that I did it, because knowing... I mean, it's it's such an obvious thing. Like, I either figure it out as I go, or I can figure it out in advance. And as I'm writing Unicorn Western, I'm about ten thousand words in because I get a slow start. Um, I'll finish it next week. It uh, it's it's been simple to go through and and read the things that you wrote, even though it's just a few paragraphs for each. And the fact that there are discernible chapters, it's like it's twelve chapters. Yeah. The chapters are like two thousand twenty five hundred words each. Then I have a real like architecture for the story, and it makes sense. So I decided for Fat Vampire Three, I'd do the same thing, and it's it's a cool like it's cool to see the story forming before I actually start writing it. And so I'm sus- I'm wondering if the actual writing will feel the way I normally feel when doing a second draft, where I discover yes, things that weren't. Yes, it absolutely yeah. will. And 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 so this is a very good time where we should all just get together and 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 tell Dave that Sean's system works. Well, I'm certainly wanting to try it. Do you not like the beat system, Dave? <clears throat> no, he doesn't like to put math and art together. And for me, I'm always looking for a formula. Dave wants to beat oh, something into submission. I should show you. I have these little post-it notes right here where I have been mapping out. I figure that I, I, the, the schedule that I currently have, I can write 124,000 words a month, write slash edit. Awesome. So you talk about combining math. I'm like, okay, so in an average session, I have this much. 
Unicorn Western is going to be about 30, 30K words. And then since you're doing most of the editing, I'm counting that as like a 15K word yeah. edit. And so, I mean, I have everything. No, like, dude, I'm exactly the, the same. I've got <laughs> spreadsheets going back to May 10th when yeah. I started. And, it's, and, and it's, it's literally like, I don't improve it week to week, but I do improve it greatly month to month. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what's, what's the thing with you and the beats, Dave? You, how do you like to do it? Uh, I got no problem with the beats. It's just sometimes when I'm writing the beats, uh, I, I want them more thorough. If it's something that I'm plotting out more and Sean isn't on the same page with me, uh, creatively speaking in some aspects, especially in some areas like dialogue, I feel a need to like pretty much write almost the full thing rather than just beats. Uh, because some, some, sometimes, you know, it gets it right. Uh, and, and when I say right, I'm being you know subjective. It's right how I see the story. Uh, other times, if we're doing something that's more both of us together, then you know I, I'm I'm more than happy to do that. Yeah, D Dave. Dave did beats for um for Monstrous. The, actually, this was kind of cool. So we finished Monstrous six, but we didn't have the end done. The last chapter and then the cliff. Hanger basically wasn't done. So we had a story meeting just for chapter six, which I don't think we've ever done before. But it was cool because it's the it's the finale. Like it deserves that amount of attention, that last chapter. And I love, 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 love this last chapter. And Dave's beats were fantastic. They were see, because because the beats either go <laughs> they were basically like a list of um of like I know there was probably 40 or 50 lines there and each one was one sentence. So each sentence, basically I turned into a paragraph and that was really, really easy to write. And I was really confident we were on the same page <clears throat> where the other way, when the beats like the ones that he wants to half write himself and half are beat it out, then it's like, I'm never in one mode or the other. I'm either rewriting or kind of writing and, and there's, it's very difficult to find a flow. So this was perfect. And when I get rough drafts, that's perfect. When it's in the middle, it's a little harder. And we always work our way through it, but it's a little harder to get through that. So, so here's a question, and we're really drowning in minutiae here, but maybe some people <laughs> actually want to hear this. People have requested minutiae. Yeah, no, this is good. <laughs> no, I'm not even kidding. They're like, yeah, they're, they're like, we want to get into the nuts and bolts. Yeah, Can no, this is explain how you beat it out, boys. <laughs> <laughs> this is good collab stuff because, you know. Uh, like, okay, so, so, so here's a question on beats. Uh, would you, how, how about in an area where I, I think I have the dialogue down better? I do dialogue and beats. Would that work, or does that mess well, you yeah, up? You know what you could actually do is just, just separate Fuck it. yourself! <laughs> oh. So if you wrote, like, let's say you wrote 10 sentences that are just, like, one-line beats, <clears throat> oh. and then you leave a space, and you cover that section, and you're like, just edit this bitch, and then you move to another section. So I know when you... Because I don't know when... There's no spaces. It's just all written in, a, in, in linear, where some of it's telling me what you're saying and some of it's actually saying it and I don't know what is what sometimes. That would mess me up because yeah, it would feel it's really like, hard. Yeah, it would feel like partially summary <laughs> and partially completed stuff. You know yeah, what that's it exactly it. Yeah. You know what it reminds me of? The thing that I'm doing for, for Fat Vampire, I mean you like played with the outline, it was nutty. But for Fat <laughs> Vampire 3, um, it's, it reminds me of, I don't know, you guys have probably never had to do this, but when I submitted my first novel to uh, agents and stuff, sometimes they would ask for a summary. And it was obnoxious. Like you had to go through chapter by chapter and write. But if you do it, the summary first, that's, that's exactly, the base of your that, outline. That, that's exactly it. Yeah. So what I'm, what I'm creating now is like what I created after the fact for the Bialy Pimps. And since it's, it's re so I, I'm through about, I have 3,000 words now in, in the outline, and it, it'll probably be five would be my guess. So that's a pretty detailed outline. Um, and I'm sure it'll change, but I get, I, I'm kind, I always thought it was a pantser, and what happened is I would just meander all over the place, and I, so when I was writing Unicorn Western today, I think I did 2,500 words in an hour and a half, so that's pretty good. That's great, And it yeah. was because I knew what was, and plus it was a fun scene, it's where, well, I don't know that I want to get into that. But, um, yeah, <laughs> well, I don't, fun. I don't, don't know. Don't ruin it for the children listening. Yeah. <laughs> it, I don't know how much this yeah, will help. But, but when I do it, it's just straight for myself. Like on the 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 children's property that we're working on has um, those are basically ten thousand word stories. So they're almost like a short, but they run long sometimes, up to thirteen, fourteen thousand words. So they're a lot like our individual episodes, um, but they're really, really simple. 
because what they are is that there's a headline and we, we actually come up with the headline before there's any story. So it's like one of the ones I'm doing right now is help my father's a werewolf, right? So that, that informs the story. Then at that point, um, I write an outline for myself that's very much like um, the one I gave you for Unicorn Western Johnny, which is funny and just like, and then, you know, like cursing because I'm talking to myself. So it's just right, funny. right, right. But then I take that and I break that down far. So each of those chapters will then have six significant events and each significant events will have six, six questions for me to answer. So basically I just have a list of questions like, what does it look like? How does he feel? And I just, and, and literally I can get a 10,000 word draft out in a day on that formula. You, uh, the, the outline you gave me for Unicorn Western, it breaks it into 12 chapters of, like I said, 2,000 to 2,500 words each. And the outline is 2868. So that's, it's not, mine's, gonna, mine's a lot more detailed than that. But it's because I'm doing it on purpose. Like it's not like I feel that I need to do this. It's just how it's coming out. I'm mm -hmm. like that. You know, oh, this could happen. And I'm kind of making notes to, because it's. I know this is. You guys are probably going to laugh at the idea of this, but Fat Vampire Three is turning out to be a political book. <laughs> I mean, it's it's funny and it's vampires and it's horror, no, but, but it is about the, the politics. It's like yeah. you could say you're a plotter or a pantser. It doesn't really matter. You can plot and then pants your way through your plot, which is. Fun. That's for me, it's become my most favorite way to write. We and, have a and, general idea yeah. of what we're doing, but we really color outside the lines once we're there. And that's, that's what I was saying, and I'm, I'm going to be really curious to write this because the experience for me is I, I'm lost during the first draft. And I, I, I figure it out, but I'm kind of all over the place. And then when I go back and I rewrite, the first few chapters are like a rewrite because I didn't know what the hell I was doing at that point. Yeah, you should be a lot, lot less... Um... Uh, but it's not even it's time. not even the a lot less and it's not even the lost it's the read through uh when i read it through i figure out things that i figured out only at the end and then i'm like oh that's the way like it's it's like i learn things about the world as if it were a real place and then yeah. like oh i got to go back and change that so i think what what's going to happen this time is because i've written a comprehensive outline i'm going to learn that stuff as i write the first draft yeah exactly cool i agree but I'm I'm liking the collaboration idea, with uh, the thing that's going to be hard for me, the thing that's going to be challenging for me or difficult or different I guess, is I'm writing this draft and then normally I would know that I will go back I will read it I will find those things and I know that this time you're going to be the one to find it. Are so you commenting as you go along? Are you doing it in Scrivener? I am, but I haven't made a lot of comments. Yeah, just a anything you have a question on, just leave a comment. Like, oh, I, it's not, I, that's not even the process. It's it's like it's it's more holistic than that. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> but I may I may find toward the end, Sean. Like I may discover things, and then I may make notes and say you may want to go back. But you'll, I mean, you're a smart writer. You'll figure that out on your own. You don't yeah. need my help with that. You should leave a notes page that's not even comments, but just things that you think of that don't even fit anywhere. Because I do that for myself. Just one page of notes. I haven't found that yet. I've just been sort of following your... I mean, the outline has been really helpful, and I honestly haven't diverged a lot. But, like, things have been coming up the way they normally do. So we had the debate, do the unicorns talk? Because that's like, <laughs> you know, that's like... You, we talked about tone last time. Like, you have talk in unicorns. So, uh, but I discovered quite by accident when I was writing this, I'm like, oh, I, I guess our unicorn talks. And he's an asshole, Yeah, too. because we decided that he was kind of a dick, but yeah. that he wouldn't talk because that was just too much. But I loved, I, I laughed, I laughed when the thing you sent me this morning, I laughed. I mean, it was funny. And so um, if he's going to talk, I'm totally cool with that. It's just getting the right tone. And that sounded right to me. And I was pleased by the way I introduced the pink smoke and the oh, unicorns. Oh, that was so, so The awesome. unicorns bleeding, rain, <laughs> bleeding rainbows because I was wondering how to handle that. Yeah, um, the subject line of Johnny's email was LOL. <laughs> <laughs> and I read, and it's, it's, it's a very funny scene, but my daughter, when I told her I was writing Unicorn Western, I asked her if she had any requests, and she said, I would love it if the unicorns, when shot, they bled rainbows. <laughs> and, and I told Johnny, I'm like, it, we don't have to put this in, but it would be really cool, and Haley would love it if we could make the unicorns bleed rainbows. And um, yeah, Johnny found a really cool way to make the unicorns bleed rainbows. Well, I'm the, pretty sure you bleed rainbows, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> well, the the fun thing about what I the, the fun thing about the way that I handled that is that we now have an entree to do any any ridiculous dumb thing now. Like we could have, you know, 
sparks flying out and fairies fluttering. I mean, yeah, at this he point, should because poop of the marshmallows. <laughs> well, no, he doesn't. He doesn't poop gold because Edward invited the kid to <laughs> yeah, find out. That was my favorite him. part. Yeah. All right. So with that self promotion out of the way, hey, did you get anybody um uh, with Z with your 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 heartfelt plea last time that was like a UNICEF? You must donate now. I have no idea, children. but we did get a few. I would like to think that no. We naturally got a few five star reviews just because <laughs> that would be more awesome. But yeah, I think maybe some of our our peeps, you know, went up to the bat. Um, seriously, if you if you did if you left a, a re- we did get uh, I think three five star reviews since we recorded on Tuesday. So if that was one of you, like come by and tell us on comments. All one so of our audience. Yeah, if, like if they do that, they'll uh, they'll remove the reviews. They're like I'm not allowed to re- review. <laughs> well. Thanks anyway if you did, because I don't know if we did, but we we did get a few, and and they did help. I'm I'm I think we're just trying to stay above four as our average would be awesome. <laughs> we don't want to dip into that three range. Well, we just got a three just now, so yay! You Probably one of our it. listeners listening live. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck them! They're too happy. You guys are paying uh, way too much attention to those reviews. That's a recipe for disaster. I know. It's Dave's homepage. I, I wake up every morning. I put on REMs. Everybody hurt, and then I read the reviews. <laughs> oh, awesome! And then I the, cry. The, the fun thing that I've been discovering is, uh, for anybody who doesn't kind of know my other life, I came out of. I, the I always. I came out of the closet. I always cringe a little when I say this, but I, almost out of the like internet marketing Born world, star. I'm like, I'm like, I'm not an internet marketer, but I do do internet, I do do marketing on the internet, so therefore, but um, but you know, like some I'm of that. I'm not a little, whore. I just fuck for money. Right, just a little <laughs> bit. So, but anyway, coming out of that, where like I had to steel myself and just be prepared for a little bit of hate because that's just the nature of being for out me. there on the internet. <laughs> for, well, Dave did give me a little bit of hate at the beginning. That was great. It was and just was honesty, like, not hate. Yeah, that's true. But it was Yeah, it we got to love cuz you always know where you stand with Dave, which is awesome. That is yeah. an awesome thing. Yeah. Well, he he handled well, it. Also, you're caught in my gravity. <laughs> <laughs> he handled it with one of those eraser things up front where you say, "I'm just saying this, you know, s- some kind of phrase at the beginning, which then gives you carte blanche to say whatever the hell you want." For the rest of the email, it's like, "Hey, I'm not saying this in a bad way, but I want to punch you in the face." But anyway, <laughs> what I was going to say is, I I almost I was always like, "Boy, you know, I, I never really get a lot of of splashback in that world." And now that I'm now that I'm moving into this, and I kind of see both sides, you get more as an author. Oh like, yeah. Like Sean, you were saying, you said to you said once on that that thing that we did at the beginning pre podcast, you said, "I want to get out of this world because people are mean." Yeah. Well, you went to the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, but it's 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 more legitimate because um, there's. I, I just don't think the worlds are that compatible. Is all I'm saying. I think it's one or the other. I think if you want to be an internet marketer, then it's going to be hard to be an author, and vice versa. Well, no, that's not true. You could be an author and an internet marketer, but not a fiction author and an internet marketer. Those are different worlds. I don't know why, because so well, why much of internet marketing is fiction. <laughs> Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> saw that coming. <laughs> it's like a used car salesman writing stories. Well, if if you allow that, I'm separating myself a little bit. I'm still kind of in both worlds. Okay. So yeah, that, I I think there, what, went that, there went that theory. Although I, I'm not like internet marketer. Like in, I hope Dave doesn't think that I'm like one of those guys. I I wouldn't be on the podcast with you if I did. So yeah, that's true. You'd be yeah. burning down my house. <laughs> <laughs> Effigies. <laughs> Do we have uh, a topic kind of, today? Well, I, I just want to say one. <laughs> just I just want to say, <laughs> say one more thing. Busting. Uh, I want. I need to make this joke before I quit, and that's that. It's kind of amusing to me because over the past uh, few weeks or months, I've talked to, like, amiably talked to several people that I know. Sean has also amiably talked to, who we both know. Dave like wants to kill. So there you go. It's just kind of fun. It's fun that we're on both sides of that fence. <laughs> so we do have a topic, and I guess because I proposed one and Dave proposed some, and mine was the last one, and nobody really weighed in, then I, I went ahead and chose mine. I guess. <laughs> so I, I said, "What do you got?" I said, "Here's the one." We, Sean said, "What did we talk about?" And I said, "Here's what we talked about." Do you want to do that or Dave's? And nobody replied. So, um, so which one do we have? It's concept versus plot versus setting. 
Oh, I like that. Would you like me to set it up in the context? Sure. Please that I do. Imagine it. <laughs> yeah, Dave likes it when we blind. I'm confused. Him. So here's Dave, what I, talk about all three. Dave, talk about tone more. <laughs> from, <laughs> here's what I mean, and maybe my example will will help anybody who else has struggled with this. Maybe I'm the only person in history who's ever struggled with it. But before I was able to write Fat Vampire 1, I had only written the one book, and then I had tried to write a ton of other things that just went nowhere. And I remember thinking... I think I even went to a writer's conference and I asked one of the speakers, like, what do you do if your characters just stand around? <laughs> you know, it reminds me of of uh, of how uh, in, in Bart Simpson's mind, the char- cartoon characters are like, I don't know what to do because his imagination had been ruined by <laughs> TV. TV has ruined my mem- yeah. Right. So that's kind of what I was thinking of. And um, what I realized with, with Fat Vampire is that the distinction a lot of people don't kind of delineate that really would have helped me is that the concept that we came up with on Better Off Undead, episode five, I think, was, or maybe it was six, was the idea that there would be a guy who was, who was fat, who became a vampire, and then he wouldn't be able to do, like, he wouldn't be healed to, like, perfection or whatever. So he would run into these situations where he would be unable to catch prey. And that was funny, and it was funny, funny enough to create a, a, a book around. But if that had been all there was then that's just a concept. That's just an idea. And it, it doesn't go anywhere. It would be the guy shrugging and saying, okay, yeah, I'm a fat vampire. Now what? And what I realized is I needed... First of all, I didn't want to make fun of my fat vampire totally. I just wanted to have funny scenes, but I wanted him to be the hero You wanted to have book. fun with him, but that's it, different. Exactly. And I wanted him to end up being the hero. And so I needed a situation that he would get into and then get out of. Which, in other words, there needed to be a plot. And I think a lot of people miss that distinction, and I know that I did, without saying, like, so for instance, take another, take another popular vampire book, Twilight. We think, oh, it's, you know, this girl is gloomy, and she runs into this vampire, and they love each other. Well, that's not, that's not Twilight. That's like the concept, that's the setting, or something like that. The actual events that occur in the book or the movie are there's like, what, other vampires come in and stuff, and they fight. So that's what I wanted to talk about was the fact that your book does Shirtless need both. werewolves fighting <laughs> vampires with gelled hair. It's a beautiful story. Yeah, yeah it, it's like the... the, the... No, you can go ahead. I'm oh, just, God. This is, <laughs> no, if you're applauding this is me. some shit. No, I wasn't yeah. I'm so <laughs> excited by talk of shirtless werewolves. No, I'm going to go tell my children who are out in the other room yelling loudly to stop. Oh, gotcha. Okay. So, um, so in that... that that kids thing that I keep talking about where we have all the headlines. That's exactly what Johnny's talking about where each one is a concept and then you have to fill that concept with a plot. And so I'll stick with the example that, um, that, that I already used because the story's not written, but it's exactly this thing. I had to find the story. I liked the headline, you know, help my father's a a werewolf, which you stole from a dear Abby column. (laughs) That's okay. (laughs) I I I stole my stuff from, from our podcast. So I I aped it straight, but I actually stole the plot straight from Stephen King because when I, when I thought about, well, what, what could I do? What could I do? The, the, the plot that I actually came up with, and it's been, I don't know, 25 years since I read the book. So Really, all I have is a concept here. But I thought it'd be cool if I crossed that, that headline with Cujo. So it's this girl who she forgot to lock her dad up before she went to school. <laughs> and he's a werewolf. Mm-hmm. And he's going to get out. And her and mom can't go back into the house because dad's out there. So then you have a plot. Then you can build around that. You, the Help my dad's a werewolf is an idea. He, she forgot to lock him up at, you know, before going to school. That's a plot. That's actually a really, really good example because I think that a lot of people would take that and they would say, I have a girl whose dad is a werewolf and this situation might occur and this situation might occur, but that there's no way to connect them. And you yeah. could take that exact same concept and you could develop a bunch of stories around it. Yeah, there's a million stories you could do with that headline. Like there's really no limit. So it's <clears throat> about finding a story that is... You also... One thing that plot helps you do is not get carried away. Because if you know what you're trying to say, you're going to say it better than, you know, like, you know, Dave and I just did this with, with, with Monstrous, actually, because Monstrous was such a, a, a fast project. It's the fastest we've ever done anything. Um, and it, a lot of it, like, it's just, I'm really, really, really happy with a lot of this project. The, the tone, the, the rhythm that we found, 
Um, a lot of it is really, really awesome. But we really did just start with a concept because when Amazon contacted us, uh, they they asked us to pitch them, and we had no time. Like we literally, we literally pitched them the next day, and uh, like five pitches, five pitches, <laughs> summaries. <yeah. laughs> Monstrous was one of them. Um, Z was another, although that one was finished. Uh, Half of them. Uh, yeah, we we already had the the pilot written for that, but but the others were all like concepts that we just came up with that day. But that's all they were is concepts. So they liked the monstrous concept, but then we had to turn that into a plot because otherwise it was just an idea, and that was the hardest part. That's always the hardest part, you know. Um, uh, yesterday's gone. The, the flaws in yesterday's gone are there because. We started without <laughs> a plot. Now, I actually think that's one of the things that makes Yesterday's Gone sort of magical <laughs> is that we ended up finding our plot very quickly and, and threading it together. Um, but we had the space to do that. If you're writing just a straight novel, I think in, in serials, you can cheat. In serials, you can get away with it a little bit more. Um, in, a, in a novel, you really can't. You kind of know have to know what your plot is so you can write to that plot. And one of the good ways of finding uh, your plot is basically developing your characters, knowing who your characters are, what their goals are, what their fears are, and then you figure out what do they want, what do they need to get, and what's the worst thing that can happen to prevent them from getting it, and you go from there. Yeah, exactly. And and it's never you never want to ask yourself what would I do in this situation because that's irrelevant. You I would always want. <laughs> you always want to ask yourself what your character would do because that's a totally different answer. And if you're treating your characters like your children or you, then you're just, it's wrong. Now, how do you marry this with the Stephen King, or do you at all? Do you even pay attention to it? Stephen King's advice where he talks about, he, he believes that, that hu not humor, fiction should be situational. And he talks about the tools of the novelist and he talks about description and dialogue and something else and he says you may ask where plot is in all this and my answer is nowhere because he thinks that plot is clumsy and artificial I don't agree with that um, I think I think plot gives you kind of road signs but that doesn't mean you can't go off-roading it just it plot is something to pay attention to I think what he's saying I I, I don't know I cannot speak for Stephen King uh, why not? If, why why if, stop now? If I could, I'd come up with better endings. <laughs> but um, but but what I think he's saying there is that you shouldn't <laughs> you shouldn't live your life by plots because I think that that is destructive for a writer. If all you're doing is plotting out, um, that it doesn't mean you won't hit a home run. I I I I'm guessing Dan Brown writes that way, where every single page is plotted because. They're not the best books, but they're hella page turners, and that's that's the purpose. That's all driven by by plot. But um, but Stephen King's books are way more interesting, way more fun to read. The characters feel real. The, the dialogue flows um, because he's not concerned about plot. He's concerned about the characters and the situation driving the story. So I think I think the best books understand all of that and kind of blend it together. The, the thing about I think Stephen King's knock on plots is probably that they, they feel artificial uh, when, when the plot is contrived and y y you know when a plot is just, it's manipulating you. The, the, the best writers find a way of disguising that, that manipulation. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I think it's the deus ex machina, which if you're not familiar with that, it means, is it, is it God in the machine? or God in, in the machine, machine yeah. Which basically means that there is something that needs to occur, and you, as the creator, um, make it happen. In and it doesn't matter. It almost doesn't matter if it makes sense. It's like what, you seeing Deus Ex Machina when something's like, "Whoa, isn't that convenient?" At the very end, the magical or, yeah. button. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Or James James Bond never gets a sniper. Never hits James Bond. You know, yeah. despite the fact that that would be easy. He you does in Skyfall. Does he? Well, there you go. You don't necessarily <laughs> worry about what would really happen. You worry about what you need to have happen to drive forward what it is that you want to see done. Yeah, but but you can, I mean, King can knock plotting all he wants, but maybe that's why most of the movies made from his material suck. Because... <laughs>
<laughs> because they're not plotted. They're enjoyable reading experiences, but that doesn't make them good plots. And movies, you need a tight plot. Like a movie doesn't work without a tight plot unless it's like P.T. Anderson. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> that was just for you guys. Um, but, you, you know, like his movies, the little short stories that are more character studies have been turned into some very excellent films. Um, but his big sprawling novels never quite work. There's just too much there, and the stuff that's there isn't plot. It's character and dialogue and all of that. So it doesn't really make that transition to screen. I think what we're talking about here is that ultimately, even non-action sorts of stories ultimately do best when there is an element of action. So I, in, a, in a post that I wrote about this, I said that even if it's like a Jane Austen novel where it isn't exactly a thrilling Dan Brown page turner, there's still something that happens there. They don't just get around yeah. and have tea. No. And that's what you have to... So the, the comparison I drew, I think I even did this on an earlier podcast, is the, we give the example of speed on a bus... Uh, the bus yeah. is the setting, but you still need to have speed. You still need to have right. something that occurs on that bus. You can't just put people on a bus. No. No, there has to be that same. <clears throat> Unless that bus is in Miami. Good God, I could tell you some stories about Miami buses. <laughs> You're getting dangerously close to revealing where you live, Dave. Shh. <laughs> he just, he's heard. <laughs> no, those were from his college days. His wild college days were spent on Miami buses. Don't ask him what he was doing. <laughs> Nasty shit. Um, <laughs> but you can find it on various internet sites. Right. <laughs> MiamiBus.com. WTF is wrong with Dave.com. <laughs> MiamiBusBoys.com. <laughs> Miami Bus. Can you imagine the trailer for Miami Bus? Okay. <laughs> like with Crockett and Tubbs. <laughs> Who knows? We got a new story on the way. <laughs> Miami Bus. <laughs> um, following. Still, with everything trimmed down to a nice thin stubble. He's already called you Sean Johnson. <laughs> Maybe you guys could 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 become the new Crockett and Tubbs. <laughs> you calling me Tubbs? I got dipped well, on Crockett. <laughs> Dave seems a natural fit. Well, it's also things. it's also the fact that you're the black guy. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I the other thing I think about Stephen King and plot too, because I thought about that when I was when I was trying because I've always liked his advice and I I've tried to apply it. Is I think that he still he still has an idea of. The plot, it's just not what he thinks of as the deus ex machina plot. So in um, The Stand, it's not just there's a virus breakout. That's just the setting. That's just, right. you know, he needed a post-apocalyptic world. But I think people would tell you that The Stand, at least part of the description they'd give you is a virus decimates humanity. Yeah, and that really that happens in the first few pages. And it's just not, well, few for Stephen King is 100, but right. <laughs> but he gets that out of the way. And then there's the rest of the story. Well, you guys talked about this with Z, is your setting is a post-apocalyptic zombie world, but it's not really a zombie book. It's not. Zombies are there, but it's not about zombies at all. And I mean, both... We have said this, and reviewers have said this. You could put in, you could trade zombies for werewolves. It's the same story. <laughs> like, it's just insert thing here. One thing I'll say about <laughs> King, though. <laughs> um, wow. um, We're going to get to the point where nobody can make a point <laughs> because everybody's worried about getting in. in, in what do you in mean we're going jokes? to get to? <laughs> I liked when Mars said we occasionally have relevant things we say about publishing. <laughs> um, King plot. Oh, okay. Well, one thing I'd say about King is that I think he's more able to ignore plot because he grew up on such a healthy, steady diet of um, of of crappy movies and like pulp books and shit, which is actually my same background. I I never went to school to write, but I've seen so many movies and. Do you realize you just shat on Stephen King from both directions? <laughs> because his influences were all crappy things, and you, your influences were his things. Uh, um, wait, what? That's too Inception, dude. <laughs> you t you've told us before that you, that Stephen King is one of your biggest inspirations. Oh, he totally is. Stuff. Yeah. But then you you said that his it's the same, so it's shit that you're reading that. No, but I, I'm the same way. I've read, like, it's all the books and movies. It's those things that influence me. It's the same as, you know, Tarantino in a visual way. It's all that crap that he saw that he's just regurgitating. And and King is so um, fluent in plot because he's seen so much, 
like he loved the, those movies like uh you know the <laughs> Fuck you guys! I'm done. That's Dave. <laughs> Although I, I interrupted you several times before, so <laughs> the I, I think that I, I think plot comes with a certain rigidity, and I think that that's what King is objecting to. So when I'm I I still pants the outline that I'm creating. It's just an abbreviated version. I don't. Ha I mean, I I do have an outcome that I want to get to, but if I discover as I'm going that something else wants to... I mean, I don't know if everybody's had this experience, but I think that, that anybody who's been writing for a while will get to a point where they discover that things want to happen in the, the book that surprise you. It yeah. happens to me all the time. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't see that coming. I guess that's going to happen. I don't think Dave and I have ever written anything without that happening several times throughout the story. But I think a rigid plotter would say, well, that's not allowed to happen. Here's what I'm going in this direction. Like... Again, not to crap on Dan Brown, although I guess I would a little bit. He needs a, a set of very specific things to happen if he yeah. has to get to the point where there's the very little grail room. Is, there's yeah. very little room for coloring outside lines. I don't ever want to write. Like, if I had to choose between Dan Brown and Stephen <clears throat> King's style, no doubt I'd go for Stephen King because that's just more organic. It's more fun. And he will always be one of my favorite writers because he, he – I mean, he's a little self-indulgent, you know, but, but I don't mind that at all. I, I like it. I mean, I, I'm with him for the long haul. So when he's got a thousand-page book, I read every word. Like, I, I enjoy that. Dan Brown is so tightly plotted that you turn, you know, every single page and, and, and all of that, and you get through the books really fast, but it's almost like eating fast food. Like, when you're done, it's not with you. Like, I still remember it's seeing in the, the toilet. Passages. Yeah, it, exactly. It, it kind of is. It's just really fast and disposable. Stephen King, I'll still remember passages, you know, years later. And that's, 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 I don't know, like, I would just take that any day over tightly plotted. I, I, I like coloring outside the lines. But I think if you don't have some kind of structure to begin with, it's too easy to waste time and get lost. And it's not just for the writer, it's for the reader, too. If you don't have a hook to hang your story on, you're losing the reader's attention and, and you owe it to them to keep them there page to page, which, you know, love or hate Dan Brown, he does deliver for his readers a, an exciting experience. See, now, I, I actually related to the fast food experience that, that, that you were talking about because I felt this about John Grisham, too. And by the way, I like the Dan Brown books I've read and I like the John Grisham books I've read. Yeah, but I like I, Grissom a lot, actually. But but I don't care about the characters. Yeah. I don't. Because the characters, to me, in those highly plot-driven, like, exciting books, is that they're a device for accomplishing the steps that need to occur in exactly. the Exactly. Well said. And you could substitute his main <clears throat> character. I forget the, the main character in The Da Vinci Code. You could substitute that guy for, like, a woman with a speech impediment who's a dwarf or something. And it wouldn't make any it difference. It wouldn't make any difference. Where like King, even when he's telling a true story, you know, in On Writing, he talks about his babysitter, Beulah, right? <laughs> or Eula. And I, is, is it Eula? No, he, he doesn't know which. And so he calls her Eula slash Beulah. Uh, oh, <laughs> I don't remember that. That's awesome. <laughs> um, but it, I, I mean, she's like, I remember things about her because it's, it's the character. It's 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 his his things are always about the character and the situations they're in, and not about what has to happen in this page. Which is why some people hate him because he does meander, you know, a lot. Like under the dome, we talked about under the dome a few weeks back, right? Where I haven't finished under the dome, but I found this in eleven, the one I can never remember, the Kennedy book. Oh, six twenty three sixty five or something. I think it's eleven twenty two sixty. I love that we don't know it. <laughs> That's awesome. History scholar program. I think it's eleven twenty two sixty three. I bet he had to do a lot of research for that book. <laughs> what color gun smoke came from Oswald's rifle? <laughs> Pink. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't remember where I was going with that. But, but yeah, under the You're dome. You're saying that he meanders. Yeah, under the dome meanders a lot. Like you meandering lot. about his meandering. Yeah, you no, know, it meanders a lot. But, but as long as you um. And, and that's where, where there's no right or wrong. As a reader, I think some of the meandering and under the dome totally works. If you're not there to find out what happened and get there as quickly as possible, but you're there to read his prose and enjoy the characters, then he totally delivered for you with that book. If you just wanted to know why the dome was there and what they were going to do about it and, and all of the... Don't the, give anything away. I the nuggets from the plot, then 
that book is a failure because it takes like 800 pages to get that. When it could have, that same story, if we're just talking plot and story, that same story could have been told in two to 300 pages. But that's not really what he was doing. He was doing a Stephen King, which is populating this little tiny town closed in a bubble and talking about all the people who live there. And there's like 94,000 of them. (laughs) (laughs) So that's under the dome. But Needful (laughs) Things did that super well, in my opinion. Because but, the stories of the people were highly relevant to the main thing that was going but on. But don't a lot of people, um, I mean, is I don't know without reading the reviews, but is it Needful Things, a book that gets shit on for exactly that reason? I don't know. Hmm. But you would be shitting on all of Stephen King for that reason because there's no book where he doesn't go into uh, the, the, I mean, did you, I don't know if you read From a Buick 8. I, I did, uh, unfortunately. I hated, I hated that book. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was like I just didn't care about anything that occurred in it. Well, that this was the one where he car. said, "I'm gonna, yeah. reco- I'm, I'm about to retire. This is one of my last three books." And when I read that, I'm like, "Well, the world's not missing much now, Stevie." But I think he bounced back. I, I liked some of his work since then, like a lot. But I didn't, I didn't care for From a Buick Gate at all. The yeah, I, I think that maybe the differentiation between a highly plotted book and a more organic book, in my opinion, is that in a plotted book, what occurs <clears throat> is by far the most important thing, and then you need to do whatever you can with the characters to make sure those events occur. Whereas in a more organic, more situational, more character driven book, it's the characters that matter the most and you do have something that needs to occur, but between A and Z any number of things could could occur. I mean, my characters have done, have taken things in totally different directions that I didn't anticipate, and that harken back to previous works, like things that happened in Fat Vampire 2 that I, I had allowed for in one that I didn't even know I had allowed for until I wrote 2. That happens to Dave and I all the time. We'll, we'll hit like episode 5, and there's something we put in episode 2 that just works, and it allows us to, to, to really play. If we're agreeing on all this, the difference between plot and, and story and character, then, then I got to say what we do with the serials um, is a very, very neat mix of the two because I think our serials are extremely character-driven, but every episode has things that absolutely have to happen, and so we, we build the world around that. I, I, think, I think we balance that well. That's exactly what I was saying at the opening about working with Fat Vampire 3 and doing my little summary outline is I think I have found that doing that little summary outline is liberating. It's like a it's like the roughest of roughest of roughest drafts. It's like tell me the entire 40,000 word story in 5,000 words and then you fill it out later. That's what it feels like to me. So it's like writing a first draft, and, and by definition, it almost has to be situational. And I do know what I want to have happen at the end of this book, and then subsequently what I want to have happen in four and five, and it's going to be pretty damn cool. So I need to get there. Do you know how many you're going to have total? At least five, but maybe by the time I get to the end of five, I don't... I mean, and the other thing, too, and maybe we should do a whole show on this, is fearlessness. Um, some of the things that I'm thinking about doing are big. There's no other way to describe that. It, it's it's tantamount to um, killing off a major character because you're cutting off an avenue that you and you can't go back. Yeah, you you can't if you kill off one person or a bunch of people or you <laughs> do a you know something that that changes. If you blow up the Earth, you know if you had if you had a sci-fi story that took place on Earth and you blew up the Earth, like that's a fearless thing, and you're either gonna you're either gonna yeah. do really well our because finales, they can't go back. Our finales, I gotta say for for Dave and I, our finales are all fearless. Every time we, 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 we hit a finale, we're like, okay, how can we like really open a wound here? And how can and, we fuck ourselves for the next book? Yeah. And, and that, but that's what it feels like, Dave. I know you're kidding, but that's what I'm thinking. No, I'm but like, it's true. But it's yeah. fun. It's really, really fun to find your way out of that. And we did that. The first time we did that was we didn't do that with uh, Yesterday's Gone ending of season one. It was just like, okay, this is a cool cliffhanger, whatever. Season two, we did that in a half. <laughs> and then, and then white space, yes, for nevermore, yes, um, all of that. So that's really, really fun to be able to do that. It, you know, this is nothing to do with plot, but I'm just curious, Johnny, for Fat Vampire, are you? You, you have three out now, and they're two ninety nine each, correct? Two. Right, but okay. you're working on three. You're gonna. I'm correct. sorry. I, I'm, okay. Yeah. So when you get three out, are you gonna bundle? 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing your opinion on that. The problem with bundling, in my mind, is if I do one, two, and three, and I bundle, and it's a way that makes sense for me, not just the reader, because it's got to work for both, Yeah. the price would have to be, I think, higher than people want to pay on Kindle. Do you agree? No. I think if they're, they're $2.99 each now, then a bundle for the first three would be $4.99, and... That's that's a reasonable price. It's a hundred thousand words for five bucks. You don't you don't think that that's screwing me a little bit? Nine dollars versus five dollars? No, because you're 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 assuming that um, you're going to get more buyers. You're going to get more people, and short term maybe it screws you a little. Although I don't necessarily agree with that argument. But let's say even short term it does. Long term, it's still the best decision. You're getting more people who are reading Fat Vampire and Johnny Truant and who will immediately go out and buy four when it comes out for full price. No, I, I think I think you you want readers to feel like really good about what they they buy for you. I agree, but I also want to take care of myself. Well, if I were you, I would I would bundle it at at three. I would wait until you have four. Or four. Out. Four. What, four would, th- what, what would once you the fourth one comes out, you you bundle the first three. That way, that's an oh, easier purchase. And then if you hook them, then they'll go on to four, and they buy four or five. So the six. idea is that new readers always have something <laughs> always have something to be going toward. If, if you bundle three and three is all you have out, then you might... Then you kind of screw you're, yourself. You're encapsulated. Yes, I, I, that's totally agree. I totally agree with Dave. That's <clears> awesome. Okay. Well, the cliffhanger on three and four is going to be pretty... I would think you'd want to keep reading if you like the story at all. So there you go. But anyway, all right. Any more thoughts on plot setting? Any of that? No. Any more thoughts know. on jokes about Sean's hair? <laughs> Insults? About yeah. Yeah, Sean. It actually went back into. Wow, what's that one? I think drama. that's the drama. <laughs> oh wow! I don't know that one. I don't think we've ever had a dramatic moment until Sean's hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> There's a bunch in there. I think they must have added new ones. <laughs> oh, we should have done this one talking about bundles. <laughs> what? Oh. <laughs> when Johnny's like, I'm worried about the reader. Oh, oh, wrong one. <laughs> I'm worried about the reader. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing that we have going, too, is I, I've, I've mentioned this to Sean a few times when we've been talking about Unicorn Western is I'm like, you know, you got to understand that I'm still kind of in disbelief that you can actually make money at this. Because, <laughs> like, I'm at the point where, you know, I sell, I don't know, two, two, books, two books a day, something like that. And uh, that's nice, but it really kind of amounts to nothing. <laughs> and so Sean's talking about, well, should we invest in this? Should we invest in this? I'm like, dude, I still don't really believe you can make money on this. I mean, I kind of do in an abstract way because you guys do. So the idea of playing with bundles, and that makes me a little nervous, but we'll see. But actually, that's how you get to the money faster. I mean, you know this, dude. You no, know I, this. That's, that's the, like, you know this. It's, do it's, I know this? <laughs> <laughs> say it one more time. <laughs> I, mean, I hear people need to hear things four times before they believe them. Uh, seven times an email. You know this. Um, yeah, you, you you know this. It's it's about it's about bundling and always having places for your readers to go. You got you're, you you can't expect to make a living on Kindle with your current lineup. You've got Bialy Pimps, which has nothing whatsoever to do with Fat Vampire and isn't even the same reader, right? No, of, of course. And and just for the record, I don't expect to be making. I don't feel like I'm doing poorly. Yeah, I, I, I like, think I feel like I'm just not. I'm not, I don't have the catalog yet. But that said, I still am taking it on faith that this does eventually pay off. Yeah, I mean, Dave and I, for, for this whole last, what was it, last October, I know we've said this before, but last October we sold a total of 100 copies of... Um, I think that was it, September, last September. No, no, it was, it was, it was October okay. when we, after, it was cause October 3rd, we launched the full season. And that was the, the month we were on Jane Friedman and Jonathan Fields and Copy Blogger. And we were like, we, I, Johnny and I did the call. Like we were everywhere. And that amounted to 100 copies. 
And what is that? Three, three and a half a day. I mean, it was nothing. And and we're splitting that. <laughs> okay. So we basically had like 1.7 book sales a day, each of us. So that was pretty miserable. <laughs> but we just kept going on and kept going on. And, and really the only thing that's made it work for us is, is you know, just... Writing a book a week. Yeah, it, shoveling it, what, coal in the fire. All right. So this is maybe an interesting thing. And we should probably close up on this. But what... Where at what point was it that you started to see, let's say, an appreciable difference where you were like, okay, you know, January tenth, and what was what happened season, on January season 10th? two of yesterday? Season two of yesterday's gone came out, and all of a sudden, season one. Um, actually, it was before that. That that was okay. Uh, we'll go back to November. You're saying no- it took you three months. That's it. No, November was good. No, because we started, started in July. In oh, that's July. right. Okay, we started in July, so th- that's a, that was a long time. Um, Six or but, seven months. But, but in and and we wrote a lot in that time. Um, so and we, there are two of you, and there are two of us. Yeah. So so when we hit the that first, it was November because that's when Pixel of Ink picked up the pilot and made it free, and we got a lot of exposure there, and it had our first decent month. It wasn't enough to live on at all, especially splitting. But it was enough to let us know that we were on the right track, and um, that's what I that's what I'm that's what I want. I don't want enough to live on right now. I just want something where I can say, okay, this is this makes a difference. And yeah, I can but see even that it's then, broken. even then, we had a funnel. Like you still don't have a funnel. You have individual sales. So as long as you have individual sales, you're never going to have that big home run. That's like, oh, okay, here here's where it goes. And we didn't really see our. We, we saw promise of our funnel in November and actualization of that funnel in January when, when we launched season two. So you're and, defining a funnel as essentially containing bundling because I do have, to, and I know that that would only be, that would be a very small funnel, but I do have a sequel. So I do have two. So is three a funnel or is three where one is a bundled and a bundle and you have another one? Is that a funnel? Um, it, it's, a, it's a little of each, but right now you have, you have, you have two totally separate Orbits, no, but, but forget right? about forget about Bialy forget about Bialy pimps. That doesn't sell a lot, and I, I understand why it doesn't. But that's that was important to me. So just consider Fat Vampire one and two. Is that a very small funnel? Is that I would say it's not. Funnel, or is that I nothing? would say it's not quite a funnel yet because you have two independent things for two ninety nine. So where's the entry point? If the entry point is the I first see. book, right? There's no entry point for you. Have to make it really really easy to get readers into your funnel. So. Like this, we could do a whole show on this, and and I would actually be awesome. But we probably should if if Dave can be immobilized and gag. <laughs> but, but in closing, I think it would be pretty cool for you to do something that was totally different. If you, because you know, we're seeing diminishing effects on the permanent free. We've seen a huge diminished effect on permanent free, and David actually, Dave and I actually took our books off of permanent free. Um, to get them into KDB Select recently. And again, that would be something cool to talk about. Um, but, uh, um, God, funnel. Thought. Funnel. Yeah, if you did something, Johnny, that was like, you thought of something that would be really cool that your ideal reader for Fat Vampire would like, and you gave that away for free, like, um, I don't I even know. Like, I understand, like a short that was vaguely, I actually have, I have a bunch of stuff that I want to say, but it's about a project that we can't discuss yet that I would like to talk. But I, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and then you, you give that away and you get people onto to a list and that's the beginning of your funnel. The, the beginning of your funnel doesn't have to be a paid product and actually shouldn't be a paid product if you're doing it well. No, I understand. I actually have it in. I actually have a, a similar funnel in place for some nonfiction. Okay, that's awesome. Before we go, um, I don't have it in front of me, but Joanna asked us to... Um, Highlight that the what is yeah. it, the, the buyer beware site? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, oh, I don't. I didn't. I just thought of it just now. I got to bring it up. Hold now, what there. a tick! He's not even prepared. I, I will no, say I, though that, that that funnels don't necessarily have to be, uh, you know, related books. I see. I th- I think there's authors out there that can still release separate books and drive sales from one to another. I, I if absolutely you do enough, agree with if that. If you do yeah. enough. But, but it takes time to build. Well, I mean, that's. Catalog. I think that Conrad is like that. I mean, his. Right. I don't think any of his are related or. Bu- well, he did do a bundle, but that was a promo. But but he also started, you know, before this Amazon train got rolling. So it, it's hard to really say that exactly what he did. Would no, but he does out. also have a crap ton. I mean, the thing that we keep coming back to over and over and over again 
is you need to write more good stuff. I mean, it's common sense. Yeah. Entertain people and they will reward you. Right, right. It really is that simple. Um, the site for, we'll put it in the show notes, but it's Predators and Editors and it's P-R-E-D-E-D.com. And that's a buyer beware site for like Kindle. Um, we'll put your book on Kindle for thousands of dollars sort of. <laughs> sort of scams. Yeah, it's, it's the people it's, I hate. Yeah, it's publishers. <laughs> One of actually... the many people that you hate. <laughs> yeah. A small subsection. <laughs> One line on his list of millions. <laughs> D- Dave has a nested set of tags in his email of people I hate, and then but then there's many tags under that. <laughs> All right, well, we'll draw to a close this episode of the self-publishing uh, podcast. I do want to do that, 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 that funnel one. Like, that would be really good, and... Um, I'd like to talk more about that. I actually have things to say from the nonfiction side where I don't just sound like a guy who doesn't know what he's talking about. So if you guys are interested in that, um, let us know. And then, Dave, you're, are you still working on somebody to give us the nuts and bolts to answer uh, the question that we got from uh, uh, Alex about details? You said you were going to find us a guest, so we didn't have to talk about it. Uh, yeah, I'm... I wasn't sure if we were doing it for this week or next, so yeah, I'll line it up for next week or try. Whenever, to. whenever. All right, all right, everybody. So this has been the Self Publishing Podcast. Enjoy, have fun. We'll see you next time.